Maryland has always been the home of pioneers. From her wooded hills and hard granite soil came men who built a young nation, then pushed on westward, stretching that nation the breadth of a whole continent. And today, New England is the home of a new generation of pioneers. In a valley near Rowe, Massachusetts, the vast dome of a nuclear power plant rises against the quiet, circling hills. This is the third generation of Westinghouse reactor development, which began with the Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. Then shipping port, which provides power for the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And now Yankee, built for the Yankee Atomic Electric Company, owned by New England's 11 principal electric utilities. To understand it, to appreciate the functioning of this 134,000 kilowatt plant, let's look inside for a moment and see how a nuclear power plant works. Basically, the closed cycle reactor station operates on a simple principle, embodying a primary and a secondary heat transfer system. In the primary coolant loop, ordinary water of high purity, kept under pressure to prevent boiling, is pumped through the reactor. The reactor contains uranium fuel and control rods. The water serves as a neutron moderator as well as a heat transfer medium. Heated by the fuel, the water flows through a steam generator. There it gives up some of its heat and is then recirculated by the pump, repeating the cycle. In the secondary coolant loop, which comprises a separate water circulation system, saturated steam is produced in the steam generator and flows through a turbine generator to produce electric power. The steam then goes to the condenser and as water is pumped back to complete and repeat the cycle. The use of separate systems prevents the possibility of transferring radioactivity from the primary system to the turbine and condenser. Thus, the heart of Yankee is its nuclear reactor. And fittingly enough, it has its beginnings here, in the good earth, where is mined its basic element, uranium. The uranium ore is then refined, processed, and enriched at plants such as those of the Atomic Energy Commission at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It arrives at the Westinghouse processing plant in the form of powdered uranium oxide, which is then mixed with a plastic binder. The resulting material is passed through a granulating and pressing process, which transforms it into pellets. The pellets are then sintered in a special furnace for six to eight hours to harden, shrink, and remove air pockets in the material. After sintering, the pellets are ground to close tolerances, the last step before they're shipped to the Westinghouse Atomic Power Department, designer and builder of the Yankee reactor. From the corrugated cardboard shipping rolls, pellets are selected at random for inspection, the first in a long series of quality control checks designed to build reliability into every part of the reactor core. First inspection is a careful visual check for such imperfections as chips, cracks and foreign bodies in pellets. Upon acceptance, the pellets are released for the next inspection stage. They are measured to ensure the diameter and length conform to specifications. Diameters are held to tolerances of five ten thousandths of an inch, lengths to five hundredths of an inch. Representative samples of pellets are then weighed 
Their density is calculated using the weight, diameter, and length measurements. They're then ready for the next step in the process. The cardboard container is unrolled and clamped flat on a movable table. The uranium oxide pellets are stored in a container called a transfer tube. Meantime, the stainless steel fuel tube, which will later encase the UO2 pellets, is being passed through an eddy current testing machine. This is a quality control check designed to ensure uniform perfection in the wall of the tube. A record is made of each numbered tube. It is then weighed empty. And the weight also recorded. All this before loading begins. Now the fuel tube is positioned in the loading machine. A transfer tube filled with pellets is aligned with it. The pellets themselves are pushed into the end of the fuel tube with a short stainless steel ram. Next step, a small disc is placed on a rod in alignment with a pair of crimping dies. The fuel tube is then brought over the rod. The pellets are pushed back to the end of the tube. There, they're locked in place by crimping the tube onto the stainless steel disc. The fuel tube is then retracted from the rod and the process repeated until the eight-foot tube is filled with 150 pellets of uranium oxide. Afterward, it is weighed again and the weight recorded so that in each tube, the amount of UO2 is always known. About 1026 grams of uranium oxide go into each tube, a total of 25 tons in the completed reactor core. Meanwhile, another visual quality check is in progress. The stainless steel plug, which will cap the end of a fuel tube, is being inspected on a shadow graph. This device, projecting an image 30 times actual size onto a screen, enables minute details to be measured with extreme accuracy. After both ends of the loaded fuel tube are carefully cleaned, it's clamped in alignment with an end plug and the plug is pressed into the end of the tube. The end plug is then welded to the fuel rod, completely sealing it and protecting the uranium oxide fuel. Then comes another important test. The fuel rods are pressurized in a helium chamber. They're then subjected to a helium leak test where the most minute holes or leaks would be detected. A final check before the fuel rods go into sub-assembly is made by X-ray. All welded areas and crimp locations are given special attention. Now the first step in sub-assembly begins. The fuel rods are stacked in a stainless steel fixture in preparation for the furnace brazing operation. These fixtures hold either 25 or 36 rods, depending on the individual sub-assembly design. Rows of short stainless steel tubes called ferrules are placed at 8-inch intervals along the length of the fuel rods. Each ferrule is plated with an alloy which will melt during the brazing operation and join each ferrule to all rods with which it's in contact. After positioning the first row of fuel rods and ferrules, the process is repeated until the entire fixture is filled. The unit is now ready for brazing. It's placed in a special retort within the furnace. There, 
After sealing, it remains for three hours at a temperature of 1875 degrees Fahrenheit. After brazing, the fixture is lifted out of the retort and the brazed unit removed from the fixture. After cleaning, the spacing between the fuel rods is checked with a special probe to ensure once again that manufacturing tolerances are being maintained. This unit is a sub-assembly. Using one end plate for positioning, nine of these brazed sub-assemblies are stacked to form a bundle or fuel element assembly. A second plate is then fastened to the other end of the assembly. After these plates are attached and bolted, clamps are placed across the fuel element assembly in order to adjust it to correct design dimensions. Tie straps are welded to the assembly to maintain the dimensions achieved by clamping. Then the entire cross section is measured again. Here is the 900 pound fuel element assembly containing nine sub assemblies, a total of 304 slender fuel rods joined together. After a final visual inspection, the assembly is covered with a plastic bag. Clamped in position inside a specially designed shipping container. And shipped out along with four similar units by special truck. Destination, Yankee Atomic Electric Company. There they're joined with other fuel assemblies, 76 in all, to form the heart of Yankee, a stainless steel core about 8 feet high and 6 feet in diameter, packed with over 23,000 fuel tubes. Today, Yankee stands as one of the great achievements in man's conquest of his environment. Like the Nautilus, like shipping port, like all the pioneer nuclear developments of Westinghouse. Yankee is another exciting point on the known horizon from which man can take one more step into the unknown. <laughs>